Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Nancy Dowd. I am product manager for Libraryware, and we are doing something very unique today. We have um, people who have signed up to our webinar. We have like 400 people there, and we have a live audience here in Santa Clarita. Everyone, can you – I'm going to take me off speaker here. All right, everyone. Can you say – Can you say hello? hello? So that's the group. So we have a fantastic program today called RA Programming for Kids. We have two fabulous librarians, Kathleen Moore, who is our current graphic designer at LibraryWare, but she also spent quite a few years as a librarian, a teen librarian. And we have Autumn Winters, and Autumn is she is a bibliographer here at Novelist, and she, too, was a children's teen, adult librarian. So they are bringing lots of experience to this webinar, and um, it's going to be a fun webinar. Now, a little housekeeping. If you have any problems, just type that into your chat box, and we will help you. We do not have the ability to chat back and forth, so if you want to use Twitter, the hashtag is or a kid, but we want lots of questions. So if you have a question, just type in the question to us. We will grab them. We'll probably do them more toward the end, but if we think that it's something that we need to qualify or answer immediately, we'll try to get to that, okay? So without any further ado, Autumn Winters. Autumn? Uh, hello, folks. Uh, like Nancy said, my name is Autumn Winters, like the two seasons. And I have a dozen years of experience working with uh, mostly teens and adults at the public library. And what we're going to talk about today uh, is a little bit about just expanding the possibilities of what can happen within your library. Um, by using passive programming and gamification strategies, right? Uh, these are the kinds of things that are really simple to use to build relationships, to increase engagement, and to increase customer satisfaction you know, the kind of things that you would put on your strategic plan. But we're going to come at it sideways through uh, using things like play, serendipity, and game. So let's take a look here. Uh, here you see the glory days of the reference desk. It's clear that those poor folks can't get anywhere in that gorgeous, enormous card catalog without going through a librarian. Those were the days. Well, these days, we're hearing more and more from librarians who are really struggling to form relationships with their customers, uh, given the um, advances in automation, right? It's hard to make friends with a customer who places holds on their phone, uh, comes to pick up the book themselves, and then checks it out through a self-check machine. And we feel like these folks are getting a skewed perception of the value of the library. You know, they see that the materials are available for them, but maybe they're not getting the same uh, experience with the staff that they would have in the past. Now, as professionals, we believe that there's more to the library than materials. So how do we create opportunities for connection between staff and customer, especially young customer, in this kind of environment? Um, so yeah, one answer is to really up your game on self-directed strategies, the kinds of things that your customer can discover on their own. So really quick, I'm just going to talk about some shared values that we all have as youth services librarians, and we'll tie those back into the strategies um, more explicitly later. Uh, so let's all uh, keep a moment to uh, think about community building, um, something we always need to do, just like this lady way back in the past is making that kid smile because of her own personal connection. Um, just one thing to keep in mind with this sort of strategy, uh, the idea is to uh, Rather than waiting for your customers to approach you so that you can really drop some science on them and amaze them with your expertise, uh, passive programming creates more opportunities for low stakes, positive, and engaging interactions, just like the one you see here. And low stakes is the key word. Um, now, of course, as youth services librarian, our ultimate goal is to lead customers to the library resources that will really make a difference in their lives. That's anything from books relevant to their interests, like the, these guys from the School of Aviation Trades. I'm sure Joe there was really excited to see all those cool airplane books on his shelf. 
uh, to the kind of community that they can find at a more conventional program when you require kids who have a shared interest to share the same room at a certain time uh, to really that, that really important in, uh, relationship that they can have with you, like that mentoring relationship that will really empower them to become caring, connected, and successful adults. So how many of you have a similar scene to this but more modern in your library? Uh, when I was a teen librarian, I'd regularly get groups excited and talking about whatever the, the hot topic was at the moment, whether it was Twilight, if they had the Guinness Book of World Records out, and they'd all be talking about different facts, maybe that they wanted to try to beat, all sorts of different topics. If you see this in your current library, if you'll type it either in the chat or the QA, we'd love to hear what those sort of hot topics are in your library. Absolutely. So really, let's think about this in terms of serendipity. Um, passive programming is a more gentle approach that will allow you to interact with your kids, whoever they may be, in a, rela in a relaxed and a creative way. So if a regular program is more like throwing a party, you can think of passive programming like planting the seed. Really, all you're trying to do is to make them feel comfortable with you, with the space, and as part of the library community. And one of the really great things about passive programming is that once you find what works or what your kids are interested in, you can really grow that out and expand it into more traditional programs and outreach. So if you find that your kids love the juggling books that you leave out, um, you can have a program on juggling where you either watch YouTube videos or you have them teach each other to juggle. So you can really expand on these passive programs and it's a great way to sort of test the waters on different programming ideas. Exactly. Uh, what you're looking for is a clue, honestly, and uh, you're going to be getting these clues through a more indirect kind of communication, which is really what we're going to talk about today. So, um, just a couple uh, points on why passive programming is so powerful, even though it has sort of a wimpy name, unfortunately. Um, the nature of this kind of programming is to save time, or rather, to create meaningful time. You know, you don't have to do a lot of prep work and hope people will show up uh, in the way of a normal program. Instead, you will do very little prep work and let your customers engage when they will. Uh, it's all about going with the flow, you know, similar to that uh, new idea about unprogramming. Um, what you're trying to do is just to create an expanded idea of what can happen in the library. And even though we like to plan, we like to know exactly what's going to happen, what you need to do with these is just to allow for a little bit of instability uh, and that will create more room for possibility within your space. Um, practically, it's really great when the kids in your community are too distracted and busy to make an effort to come to your library at a certain time. Uh, it's also super good when you need to show a particular subset of your kids that you see them and you notice them, but maybe you don't have a lot of time to, de to devote to one another, you know, like your anime kids or your skaters or your Minecraft experts. You know, just place something in that space like a display or an activity that speaks to their interest and uh, let them know that you see them. And it's also great regardless of the type of library you have. So if you're in a library that has sort of a handful of kids sort of trickle in at various times and come and check out books, or if you are more in a setting like I was where you have an entire crowd of kids that you need to engage on a regular basis. So it's truly adaptable um, to create meaningful time with the kids. And it sounds like Santa Clarita, Minecraft, and Lego are really popular with the kids. Fantastic. Yeah, those are really good um, places to start with some passive programming. You know, you can put the Legos out there. There's a lot of paper craft you can do with Minecraft that would work really well as passive programming. So you guys are uh, well primed for this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, let's be honest here, a lot of libraries don't have a ton of money to spend on their programming. The great thing about this, it's very cheap you're using resources and materials that you already have, like the space of the library, um, the copy machine, office supplies, uh, and the creativity of your staff. I just want to reiterate, none of this has to be rocket science. Um, you're just trying to add an element of surprise. Um, you can think of it like a Google Doodle, you know, just something that's a little bit extra, maybe a little bit um, educational, and may not stay around for that long, you know, you're just throwing something against the wall every once in a while to see how they take it. So what we're going to do first is to offer you three really, really simple tools to make your team space or your youth services space more interactive. Uh, in fact, these tricks work if you don't have much of a team space. 
when I started out, uh, MySpace was on a silent floor that people rarely visited, and we had a set of shelves and a wall, and really it was more about creating a mental space so that the kids would begin to believe that we were serving them and seeing them, even though the teen space was nothing spectacular. And uh, these all work on that same principle I keep talking about of, I see you. So the number one thing I would, um, I would recommend, if you don't take anything else away from this uh, webinar today, uh, this one is so simple and so effective, um, the suggestion box. Again, it's not rocket science, but the secret here is that you want to respond to the questions that you are asked within that box in public. So you're going to post your answers, maybe above it or around it, and you're going to keep them up for a while so that there's, you're creating a space for dialogue, really. Um, yeah, it's really a space where people can speak freely, and just having that kind of thing shows that you value openness, transparency, and honesty in communication. You're really trying to create the atmosphere of respect and trust that is the foundation for successful youth services at any time. Um, so practically, what does this mean? Well, the kinds of things I would see in my suggestion box um, were things like really common uh, reader's advisory questions. You know, if everybody's interested in a certain book, you can give some suggestions there as part of a dialogue, and it seems more organic that way maybe than even having a um, bookmark or something prefab. If you do it in your own handwriting and you're like, yes, here are, the, here are some suggestions, that can uh, seem more personal. Um, but the real power of the suggestion box is that it can be really revealing about what your customers don't understand about library policies and procedures. Uh, in my case, I got a lot of questions that indicated the kids didn't understand how to place holds or that you could place holds or that they could suggest materials for us to buy. You know, these, these are the kinds of things that you would hope they would know or that they would feel free to ask you, but maybe they don't even know how to ask you. So they'll say something indirect, like, I've never seen Fault in Our Stars on the shelves all summer. Why don't you guys buy more copies? And so my response is to share a little bit of inside baseball with them and say, well, our policy is to buy more copies when we have, um, let's see, we have three copies per hole at the time. And so, you know, it explains how to place a hold, why you need to place a hold, reassures them that they will eventually get the book and that we do see them and notice uh, what they want. Um, same thing with requested materials. You know, kids were sort of bedazzled by the whole idea that we would purchase things that they like. Um, and that leads to the next uh, thing that your suggestion box will give you. It's a place to discuss uh, hard questions in, in confidence. Uh, that's a way for you to demonstrate your advocacy to them directly. So, for instance, um, my kids would ask for things like, uh, why don't we have more iPads to check out? Or, you know, equipment things that they dreamed of, right? They would share that with me, and I would honestly say, well, our new budget year starts in July, so don't look for anything before then. I will pass your dreams on to the people who can actually make that happen. Because as a youth services librarian, sometimes you're the middle manager between, you know, the kids and the administration. Um, so be honest with that in both directions. Um, and this is a really cool way to do it. Do any of you currently use suggestion boxes? What works for your library? Uh, we'd love to hear if you type that in via chat so we can see your answer. One of my favorites was the, all the jokes or the disrespectful comments that would come in in the box. Yeah, they feel like they can fool with you a little bit through this, again, because it's indirect, so they'll um, they'll leave crazy stuff, and you can either post it or not, you know. They'll also leave beautiful things like, I love the library, and that'll just give you the strength to go on for another day, you know. Again, it's just, it's openness. Okay, and another really simple thing you can do, um, this is, this is a, again, an interactive display idea that you can just keep rolling all the time, um, kind of a public vote. So I know in the literature there's a lot of talk about 
Ask your teen advisory board what color the new paint should be for the new teen space. But if you're not going to have any new paint uh, anytime soon, it's okay to ask them about things that may seem more inconsequential. Like uh, this young lady right here who is trying to decide what sort of Doritos she loves the best. You can ask them nacho or Cool Ranch and let that inform your decision when you're buying snacks. Uh, you can ask them Divergent or Hunger Games to see which way that trend is going. Uh, really, what you're doing is you're setting up two things in opposition and just seeing which one they like the best. Um, practically, you can just do this with two containers and some sort of a marker, whatever works for you. Uh, I had two milk bottles that had pictures of the opposing ideas on them and a roll of tickets from Office Depot. It was not that difficult to set up. Uh, recently, I just saw a mason jar insert that had a little slit in the top. And if you want to get really, really Pinterest about it, that would be just the thing. So yeah, my advice on this is just to change the question frequently, uh, let them know who won last week, and sort of use it as a micro-research, right? Like, you're doing a little bit of market testing. Do they like Sherlock better than Doctor Who now, or do you want to set things in opposition? Um, the real beauty of this one is it lets them tell you what they're sick of, because it won't get any votes. Like, uh, I learned that when I put up Nicki Minaj versus Lady Gaga, poor Lady Gaga, did not get any votes. So I said, okay, that's finished. Thank you, kids. And you can also take the answers that you receive via the voting and turn it into programming and book displays. So if you find out that they love um, Nicki Minaj, pull some CDs from your collection. Or if you find out that they don't like Lady Gaga, make a little sign that says, stick of Lady Gaga, and then offer CD suggestions. Um, or pull together a Sherlock book display if they tell you that they're interested in Sherlock. So those are some really simple ways that you can pull relevant book displays to really go back to RA. You can also have them pick the next title for your movie night or game day, and that way you know that it's something that they're going to be interested in. Um, are any of you currently doing any sort of you choose type things? We see that a couple of you are using um, either comments or one library is using a folder where they can tell books they would like in the collection. Nice. Excellent, yeah. Um, yeah, Kathleen, you have a really good point. You have to respond to what you find out. You can't just find out something amazing and be like, well, that's nice, duly noted. You know, take action on it and um, it'll be stronger for you. Okay, and my third really simple strategy here is uh, to just give them a place to write, sort of a moderated space where they can write whatever they want to write. Um, they're gonna do it anyway. Perhaps this will keep it off the tables. Uh, but yeah, just the chance for them to, you know, sort of write down the cryptic notes and uh, memes and things that really make up their culture, to share that within your space will make it seem more relevant and engaging to them. Uh, when I did it, I had a chalkboard, a little kid's chalkboard and some chalk. Uh, kids would write their Instagrams up there to try to connect to the other kids who maybe were visiting the library asynchronously from them. Um, they would, you know, write all kinds of things, little quotes and whatnot. Uh, one story I always tell is about one of my regulars who um, she really liked that rap group Odd Future. How do I know this? Okay, she didn't talk to me about it because why do I even know what that is? But uh, she felt she felt brave enough to write uh, Wolf Gang, which is like their little meme on that chalkboard. And eventually I was like, oh, it always says Wolf Gang after Carmen has been here. So what I did was I just wrote her a little note on that chalkboard to say, did you know we have some CDs by this group and you can put a hold on them? It was completely non-confrontational and, you know, nobody had to have an embarrassing conversation with an adult. So yeah, and I know chalk was uh, not in the picture for you guys. Yeah, and Autumn's library was more of a quiet library. Chalk worked great for them. In my library, it was super busy, and chalk was just not allowed with the kids. They would get a hold of the chalk and then run outside and then write all over the side of the building, um, which was a pain. So um, in our library, it was more of crayons and paper, and that tended to work for us. So you can really, whatever the materials are, you can adapt them based on your group of kids. And then we, we had a comment 
absolutely relevant to that. So I'd like to try the chalkboard or dry erase board idea, but we'd have to police it. You do. You, you kind of have to keep a tight eye on it and, you know, look at it every morning is my recommendation to make sure they're not writing up stuff that's super naughty or, you know, inappropriate. Um, but yeah, again, just, just give it a shot and see how it goes. And if it's not working for you, it's okay to let this one go. And we also got the idea uh, to use a magnet board as an option too. So we'd love to hear what's working for your libraries in terms of either chalkboard, dry erase, markers, whatever it is. Oh, that's awesome on the windows. That's a great idea. And post-it. Sweet. See, you guys are on top of this. All right, cool. Um, yeah, here's another beautiful example from St. Paul. We love this one because they actually gave the kids a prompt, which was to describe their mom in one word. And, you know, kids are going to be hilarious, so they had to write bossy boots, difficult, assertive, and diva, you know what I mean? You're just, you're getting the unfiltered truth right there. And that's what you're looking for. All right. So yeah, these, t these uh, simple tools we've been talking about, they all share a few uh, common aspects. Uh, most importantly, they're playful. Um, and our next few ideas are gonna be centered in the philosophy of gamification and play. We're gonna start talking about how you can apply that to reader's advisory. So you guys know, as librarians, we always pay a lot of attention to the value of play in libraries for the youngest customers. It's pretty standard to have a train table, some blocks, you know, even just puzzles and coloring sheets for the preschoolers. But I think the next step is to pay more attention to uh, increasing this sense of discovery for school-age kids and even teenagers. So play was huge at my library for the teens and tweens. Um, it was really successful for us, and we had daily after school, we'd have a horde of kids every day, and it was a really nice way that we could involve them. We could also quantify our interactions beyond what could be marked as reference question, reader's advisory, or directional on our everyday stats sheet. So it was a nice way to have sort of that low stakes, um, empowering success. It was, gamification was great at uh, increasing the sense of surprise and discovery inside the public space. So the kids were involved. When we had them involved, they weren't getting into as much trouble because when you leave a large number of kids unoccupied in the library, they're bored, they start doing things they shouldn't do. But if you give them little things to leave out, uh, they really responded to that. And so we're going to go over a couple of ideas that really resonated in both of our libraries. Yeah, weirdly enough, gamification and discipline are two sides of the same coin um, because really what you're doing with gamification is incentivizing certain behaviors through play. You know, we've been doing that forever. It's like the summer reading program. Um, but yeah, you were incentivizing them to be positively uh, engaged in your library instead of using all their energy to make trouble. Yep, and it's a nice, fun thing for everybody to do. It's fun as a staff member to come up with these things and see these kids get all excited about it. And it's also fun for the kids because it gives them something different to do. They're not thinking about homework for that moment or whatever it is that they're, is on their minds. They've got this sort of fun way to engage with something. Yeah, we all know the library is sort of a liminal space and you might as well capitalize on that and open it up a little bit. Um, now, somebody had a really good question. What do you put on the chalkboard to encourage kids to write on it? That's an excellent point because if you don't write anything on it, they'll think that they can't write on it. So I would just like draw a picture or a flower or a smiley face or something just so they know that it's okay to write on this surface. Right, and another idea is to do similar to what you would do with the jars where you'll put a question. So do you like Twilight or Hunger Games or whatever prompt? And if you start giving them prompts, they'll start to learn that, hey, this is our board, we can write here. You said it, the sense of ownership is really what we're going for. That's, that's super, super important. Um, so yeah, that kind of feeds into our next few slides uh, where we're gonna talk about reader's advisory for youth and by youth. Because, you know, we found out it's, um, there's a little bit more credibility if you can get the kids to recommend books to one another, right? They tend to do that in their regular lives anyway, so bring that into your library spaces. And uh, just a few really quick, simple ideas that we had. Um, Nancy had a great idea, actually, to do a When I Was a Kid book display and have the, have the teenagers uh, put that together for you, either for the, oh, it's okay, we're giving you guys a preview. Um, so yeah, either for the kids' space or the teen space, because what you're doing is drawing on their expertise and their life experience. You probably don't remember exactly what it was like in 2005, 
but they do. So, you know, give them a chance to express that. And uh, also it's a chance for them to sort of split down that age range, um, especially with teenagers. They're so caught in between adulthood and childhood. Um, usually they have to strive really, really hard to stay on the adult side, but this is a chance for them to relax a little bit and uh, reflect on what things used to be like for them. And another way to sort of extend this idea is it was successful in our library to have the older kids read to the younger kids. So on occasion, we would do that as more of a formal program. But if you have kids that sort of congregate regularly, you can absolutely do that as a passive program where you set up the space and some sort of prompt saying, when I was a kid, these are my favorite books. And then if there are younger kids around, have them practice reading to them. Kids love reading to each other, uh, especially if it's a low stake book, like a picture book or something from their childhood. Um, and it's a really great skill for them to practice as well. So another similar book display that was super successful in my library was what I like to call the found objects display. So I don't know about your library, but we always had random junk laying around, whether it was stuff left over from displays, uh, stuff from leftover summer reading prizes. We had all sorts of random stuff. And if you gather all of those things and encourage them to make a display, they love it. They get really creative. Uh, we had somebody make a robot out of a trash can and other miscellaneous parts. And that program didn't cost us anything uh, for those kids to make those items. We also then would encourage them to choose materials from different parts of the collection. So we would offer prizes um, to the kids that participated. They made a display. And sort of the more parts of the collection they used, the better the prize, whether it was just a piece of candy or whatever sort of trinket we had for the day. But we would encourage them to add CDs, books, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, depending on the age of the kids, both juvenile and either YA or easy books, uh, as well as DVDs, CDs, audiobooks. And this also allowed them to sort of think about the collection in a different way. And they also learned about the collection, but it was something that they were interested in because they would create all sorts of things that as an adult you wouldn't necessarily think of and go, oh, this trash can is actually a robot. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's super smart that you're incentivizing the behavior you want to see and letting them surprise you with their own creativity. All right, uh, one more thing we thought about, uh, which I think some of you are already using, is the idea of a post-it note book review. So this was not anything I thought about in my library, and I wish I could go back in time and do it because it's so genius. All you have to do is leave some post-its out and maybe a little bit of example language, right? Um, so. What you're going to do is to encourage them to write something on this post-it and stick it on a book that uh, where it applies, right? But it doesn't have to be as difficult as maybe those, you know, we used to ask them to write a sentence on a slip of paper, and that went nowhere, to be honest. Um, but with something like this, they can use language they're familiar with, like uh, tagging language or hashtag language, uh, and say things like, so scary, or all the feels or can't wait for the sequel. Um, again, you're just you're coming to them on their own terms and letting them decide how to uh, use the material. And really um, what this does is it's a sneaky way to sort of get them to reflect on their reading experience so that they can articulate that better to you. And also, um, yeah, you're teaching them a little bit of appeal language, to be perfectly honest. You know, you might want to put up some of the terms when you use your novelist and see if they can apply those to uh, appropriate books if they get excited about it. And then you can bridge the gap to say, well, we have this super cool database that uses the same words you just used to find new stuff. Have any of you used uh, Post-it reviews with, and had any success with that? If so, type in the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear that. And also, Post-it reviews also provide a way for kids to leave discrete recommendations for each other. So maybe a kid will read a book in the YA section and they'll be really drawn to the fact that it's a love story about two boys or whatever the topic is. And if they write just a little note saying, love that this was two boys, another kid sees that, it's a really discrete recommendation there. A kid doesn't have to come up and say, well, I'd really like a love story about two boys. They get rid of uh, that concern, they can take that post-it post note off and nobody will really know 
what that book is they're checking out, so they have that sense of sort of security and they can feel safe in what they're picking up. Yeah, exactly. Discretion is key here. Um, I see a couple of interesting questions coming in. Don't the sticky notes fall off the spines? I have two answers for that. Um, yes, and it's okay, or you can put them on the front, you know. <laughs> um, really, there's no rules, honestly. Uh, if you want to tuck something into the front cover, it would be all right. And I also see somebody who says, uh, we didn't leave out the post-its, but some of the teens who hang out here after school have been doing it on their own. That's the best possible outcome. Give them some fancy post-its. You know? They'll be so excited. Uh, yeah, perfect. That's beautiful. We had another question asking if this is for kids or just teens. Um, I would imagine that if it's an older kid, more towards a tween age, it would probably be successful. Younger kids, probably not so much. Um, yeah, I don't know if they can reflect on their reading experience to the same extent that a teenager naturally would, but you could try it. Oh, great. Another library, uh, patrons, either kids or adults, recommend a book or a movie. They put a gold star, which is a sticker, on the spine. And that way, other patrons know that the gold stars are their favorites. That's, that's another really great idea. That's brilliant. All right. And just as an um, adjunct to that sort of post-it idea, uh, we have a cool uh, library from Dothan, Alabama that sent us an example of what they're doing uh, with post-it note poetry. It uh, looks like they put out some themed, um, themed post-its and uh, put up a little bit of a prompt. You know, you can do this for National Poetry Month. Um, yep, you can do it year-round, so maybe your community has an apple festival. Then you put up little apple notes or you prompt them with a word of apples or whatever it is. You can really tie it back to current events that are happening in your community. And this is super easy, low stakes, um, and it's a really nice way to decorate your library. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. It looks like a few folks have been doing this for the uh, last few weeks. We would love to hear some of your poems if you'd like to share them. I would also love to hear if any of you are taking this into the digital space so that you've got these poems or post-it notes in your physical space, but do you ever bring those into either Facebook Twitter, Instagram, um, how are your kids and teens sort of engaging with your library digitally, or are they engaging? Okay. And um, on a similar note, uh, book poetry, this is the simplest thing. I love this slide because it shows you exactly how to do a passive program. Really, all you have to do is place out a flyer that has some directions on it and use materials you already have, like your book collection. Right, and so here the titles are actually writing the poem. And the kids could really have fun with that. And then we've got a library here that says, we did spine label poetry. The kids took the books and set them up on an empty shelf. So that's a really easy, great way to do a passive program. And you can sort of see what kind of titles the kids are engaged with. You can see what kind of jackets pop out. And that's a great way to see uh, for creating future displays. You can see what they're drawn to if they were just, just truly browse the collection. Yeah, that's, that's uh, really important. And I like how you uh, gave them a shelf, you know, for them to fill up. Just something that simple can make them feel more empowered in your space. Okay, so um, I don't know if you guys have seen these little uh, origami stars you can make out of a strip of paper, uh, but we think this is a really good way to engage your kinesthetic learners, the kids who are dying to do something with their hands after a long day of school, kids who need to move. Um, Give them some strips of paper that they can fold into these stars with really simple directions. Anybody can do it. I've done it. And, uh, you know, you can expand it to ask them, by asking them, you know, write a book title that you would recommend to somebody or write your favorite quote from a book or write something that you just want to share indirectly with someone else. And um, I don't know, I can see this uh, being used as an engagement point with a staff member. Uh, the staff member could collect these and then give them out at a certain time, you know, on Need a Star Wednesdays or whatever, or uh, if you have a really, you know, active and booming team space, you, you wouldn't really have to monitor it. You could just let kids leave those there for whoever would pick them up later. And we've got a library that says they're doing a program where they put grocery bags over the books and call it Pick a Blind Date, and so you can't see the cover until you actually check it out and start reading the book. Oh, this is cool. Somebody says uh, about the poetry, um, we do this, we call it Game of Tomes and post the poems on Facebook. That's a free one, you guys. Book poetry called Game of Tomes. All right. We got a question about finding directions for making stars. We can send out some resources after this 
um, about how to make the actual stars. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And similar to the stars, origami, origami was huge in my library. It was one of our, one of the programs that we did multiple times a week. Occasionally, we would have an actual program where we'd sit with the kids and make origami, but more often than not, we would just put out supplies. So we'd give them the paper, we'd leave out some origami books, and the kids would really take to it. Um, they loved creating different animal creatures. Some of the kids got really advanced. We'd need uh, YouTube tutorials. And it was a really great way to get kids to engage with us. It was also a nice way to pull in the collections. So it started with origami books, but then it became cool it became clear that the kids were really interested in Japan. They thought it was really cool. So we started pulling out some nonfiction books on Japan. It turned into some other paper crafts. So it really blew out from there. Another sort of origami-like thing that we did is, you know those little paper footballs that you flick on the table and the kids like hold up their arms? We would do that around Super Bowl time. And that was a nice way to let the kids have fun, play, we would have to remind them not to get too loud, but it would give them a nice way to sort of have something to do in the library or something kinesthetic so that they were actually occupied uh, with these little paper footballs. On the years that they were really engaged with these paper footballs, we would extend that out and turn it into a little Super Bowl party. We'd pull in books, so we'd have nonfiction books on the rules of football. We'd also include some nonfiction books on cooking that were kid-friendly so that they could learn how to cook different appetizers or grilling or really whatever it was that the kid was into. We would also pull in some fiction stories about football. So there's really a lot of ways that you can take something as sort of broad as origami. And if you find that your kids love animals or if they love Minecraft, you can take that, like you can take one aspect and really dive into it and fully develop it into programs. Yeah, I love how you did that because you know, all I can remember from my own youth is that anybody who had a paper football was immediately in trouble. So rather than, you know, punishing them for doing something really natural, make it into a program and go towards them instead of uh, blocking them on what they want to do. And we got a, a comment saying, our team patrons are very on again, off again. Are there any ideas to get them in and encourage them to stay? Most of them, they come in to get their books, quickly leave, or others just use the computer. That's what a lot of these passive programs um, will help you do. Different kids respond to different things. Um, sometimes they'll respond to writing on a chalkboard or if you leave out little slips of paper at the computer encouraging them. Sometimes we would send um, messages to all of our computers in the kids area telling them about an activity, whether it was a passive program or a more traditional program. We'd love to hear if other libraries have suggestions for how do you engage the teens? Yeah, exactly. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, that was my situation as well. You just have to remember that teens are skittish and they really would like to engage with you on their own terms. So that's why I recommend all these sort of sideways communication strategies. Um, because once you get the relationship built, once you get them to trust you a little bit or to even trust your institution a little bit more, they will have more of a sense of what can happen to them there and you can turn them into like volunteers and, you know, engaged regulars rather than just those regulars who come in to get material. Okay. Um, one last paper thing we wanted to share with you guys, uh, the idea of cootie catchers. This builds off Kathleen's excellent idea of football because these are paper crafts the kids already know how to make. And if you need to remember how to make them, you know, there are tutorials on YouTube, there are things you can print out and prefold. But we were thinking of this as a reader's advisory, reader's advisory strategy um, because of the element of surprise, right? Right, so you can put in some, the kids really love these, so they're really drawn to them. And so if you put in maybe some of their favorite TV shows, um, Walking Dead or whatever some of the different shows are that you find that are popular for whatever age group you're working with, you can have it sort of narrow it down and actually choose a book. Um, if you're unsure of how to get to a book recommendation from a popular show, Novelist actually has some great recommended reads lists that are based on fans of specific things, so whether it's Doctor Who or other topics. Yeah, um, and if you guys have ideas for uh, fandoms that your kids are really excited about, please, please, please 
let me know because I do a lot of those lists. So I'm trying to stay on top of it, but it's a little bit harder when I don't talk to kids every day. So please, please share with us. And has anybody tried RA like this where you do something sort of non-traditional like a cootie catcher? Uh, we'd love to hear about a library that's actually doing, with this, doing this with their kids, whether it's successful or not, what kind of things you can recommend, or if the kids just want to find out who they're going to marry. That's okay, too. What the favorite color is. <laughs> yeah, that, all that stuff is totally fine. <laughs> all right. Oh, and just a little bit of a last note about paper folding. Um, These are some cool things we got from uh, Librarian Lafayette, and they had done the uh, hedgehogs. I don't know if you guys have done the hedgehogs. Super easy. Um, you can turn them into trees. All you need is uh, some paperbacks from the uh, book sale, really. Free, free, free. And it takes a long time. So if you need to engage the kids for like 45 minutes, they will finish that hedgehog. I tell you what. Yeah, and kids love seeing their stuff on display. So if they make origami or whatever crafts and they leave them around, if you turn it into a book display, they absolutely love it. They become invested in it. They come and show their friends, look, look, I made this. They want to show their parents. And so you're really at that point getting the kids to spread the word about the library. And they're really engaging with you. Oh, cool. It looks like uh, people are doing this. Uh, somebody did hedgehogs and trees at Christmas, and somebody else did hearts, which I don't know about. So that's super cool. All right. So this is another simple one where you can do uh, what we're calling book face, where you have the kids hold up a book jacket in front of their face to make a sort of a goofy look. This is also a way that you can start to engage digitally. So whether your kids are on Instagram or whatever social network it is, they can post these pictures. You don't have to worry about uh, someone seeing their face. They're anonymous. You don't have to worry about getting permission slips signed because you've got a 12-year-old taking a picture. So it's a really nice way for them to engage and be playful with the books. Exactly. It's a little bit like book poetry because you're just using your collection to do something really creative. And also, it kind of plays into, uh, for teenagers, that idea of taking on a new identity, which they love to do. All right. So, um, the last big thing we want to talk to you guys about is a really, really fun way to make your stacks more engaging. Uh, we think about Reader's Advisory here at Novelist all the time, and Kathleen and I wanted to think about how to put some gamification strategies to work uh, to make a list into a game, right? So it's, it's super easy, honestly. It's a really adaptable act activity. And think of this as an ad adaptation of a scavenger hunt. So this scavenger hunt is based on a list of books, um, not one with clues, although you can do a scavenger hunt like that too. And it's, this is not something that has to be done in a particular order. So it just we provide a map, a simple set of shelf talkers, and it's a discovery game. So kids go out looking for, in this case, funny books that are like Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Um, this is, so you can see here the example of what we made, which was based on Diary of a Wimpy Kid, which was the most popular book in America in 2014. Yeah, not kids book, but book. So, you know, you probably have some kids who are interested in that in your library. So the map, this is sort of the key piece that the kids pick up and take around with them. So on the top, it's got some simple instructions saying, look for funny books in the library, write the book title in the bubble, and bring your finished map to the desk for a prize. That prize can be a piece of candy. It can be leftover summer reading trinkets. It can really be anything. Right. Uh, you could use it as an entry slip and for a bigger prize, you know, whatever you have around and what you can provide. Right. And so this is a, for those of you that have Library Aware, this is a flyer size template where you can actually swap out what books are used and what images are used. And so we'll show, um, once we talk about the individual pieces, we'll talk about ways that this can be adapted for your library and different topics. Yeah, and again, um, just a plug for recommended reads list here in Novelist. Uh, the Wimpy Kid list in particular, uh, I keep an eagle eye on that one because you know publishers are always putting out new things to appeal to this audience. Uh, right now it has about 25 books on it. We're trying to give you a lot of variety, you know, to um, make it applicable for your shelves and to give you a lot of choices. And that's true for all of our lists. So this one is a little bit bigger than most. Yeah, so there are lists on pretty much a lot of the trending topics that you can think of, we've got lists for in Novelist. Yeah, exactly. 
So the piece here you see is a shelf talker. And so these are placed out in the stacks where the books are, and it helps the kids identify where these books are. So they see sort of that same color, the sort of silly, I'm funny, or he, he, he. And they see the Diary of a Wimpy Kid jacket, and it tells them what the books are. So it helps them find the titles that they want uh, to fill in the blanks on that map. If the book is checked out, it's a little place card just to show, hey, look, this is what the book is named. Here's the uh, really short annotation. And it has a little bit of language about if the book's not here, ask the place to hold. So you sort of plant that seed of if a book is not there, the kid still has access to it. And this is a really nice way to engage kids in the stack. So it gives them a reason to go down a particular aisle if you're sending them sort of on a quest or a scavenger hunt. And then they have shelf talkers to help lead them along the way. Yeah, in a way, this is sort of a precursor to the post-it note recommendations because you're sort of getting them to begin to think about the idea of reading a book besides the book they meant to come get. You know, that's your first step in that uh, whole process. And so what works for you guys? Here are another couple um, topics that we made that we can show you just to give you an idea of how versatile this is, where it can either be about wrestling, so you've got a wrestler in the background, or you've got a treasure map and it's about pirates, or it's about soccer books. Um, this is adaptable, so if you want them just to find titles on a specific topic, or if you want to ask them specific questions, each little bubble can be about a fact. Um, it can be fiction or nonfiction. You can really go in all sorts of directions with these maps. Yeah, what I love about this is that some of them solve problems and answer questions that I get all the time. I remember answering the wrestling question constantly, and it was difficult for the kids because to really uh, get the stuff they wanted, they would have to travel from kids' section to teen section to adult section, maybe to DVDs uh, within our space, magazines. You know, you're sort of, you can use this to increase awareness of just how much stuff you do have. Do any of you currently do scavenger hunts? Um, it was something that we would do multiple times a week in a li my library just to engage the kids. They really enjoyed it. Um, they had fun finding random nonfiction facts. They learned about that we have atlases, world maps, all sorts of resources that they would have had no idea about, and they would get really excited when they'd find an answer. Um, I'd love to hear about scavenger hunts in your library or topics that you think that would work for scavenger hunts. And this is something that's, once again, super easy to do, and it's easy to adapt. So if it's for younger kids, having them write something really simple, or if you want the older kids to work a little bit harder, you can do that. If you've got maybe a scout group coming in that needs an activity, this is a great way to get them to explore the library and learn about different aspects. We got a question about prizes. We would often do just like a, either a mint or some super cheap piece of candy that we'd have laying around. Sometimes we do um, summer reading tr trinkets. Sometimes we would do a little bit of extra computer time. It really depended on how many kids were involved on a given day. Yeah, we always had a lot of extra paper goods around, like little posters and promotional items, things like that. And that was a fair way to distribute those rather than just placing them in the space for first come, first serve. Oh, great. So we've got a couple people that are doing scavenger hunts several times a year but they're very popular with their kids and they learn a lot about the what they have, the hours, names of who's working. Oh, and this is great. A library has a group of moms that donate all of the Happy Meal prizes they collect and they hand those out as prizes. That's brilliant. So there are a lot of really creative ways that you can come up with prizes for little or no cost. So yeah, you guys, um, I hope we've inspired you here today and sort of given you some ideas that you feel like you can run with. Do you have any questions? Also, are there any additional ideas that work in your libraries? Yeah, that makes sense. I see uh, somebody has chatted to us that they have local businesses that donate coupons as prizes. That's a classic. We got a question asking if we have uh, templates of the maps we can use. If your library has library aware, uh, we have a template that you can use and swap out the images. So the three samples that you saw later, 
for all created in LibraryWare where we simply swapped out that background image. So a, a great passive program that somebody's suggesting having a chess and checkerboard so that those are set up so the kids can play. Yeah, that's always a good idea. Any kind of, um, again, low stakes, low cost materials, you can just sort of let them be. I know that a lot of librarians do check out for board games, but doing chess and checker, those are from the dollar store and you won't be super sad if they disappear. So smart. Okay, guys, um, we were hoping to hear a little bit from Santa Clarita, if possible. Hey, we got a great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, Santa Clarita loved your ideas. We we were frantically writing down notes, and we we love the ideas. The um, we love the. The suggestion box, this group really used comment cards, right? Yep, yep, similar. But it's kind of I'm, I, it's kind of unfair to put my poor group on the spot here. Okay, <laughs> no worries, you guys. Yeah, um, this is a great presentation. I love the way that you kind of brought it to very simple ideas, right on to the, a little bit more sophistication in terms of scavenger hunts. They were really great ideas. And also, love the idea that this can go anywhere from kids to teens. And Autumn, your reminder that teens are usually, they don't necessarily want a face-to-face -face interaction. So how can we really start to engage them without being face-to-face? -face? It was really dynamic. Well, thank um, you. Are there, yeah, really. Are there any questions Hard in one. the queue that we're not seeing? We got a couple of comments about prizes. Um, somebody says they charge late fees for DVD. So if you charge late fees on DVDs or your books, a good prize might be a free day coupon, free fee day coupon. So they keep that movie a day longer. Yeah, it's like what you said about extra computer time. That's, again, something you can offer that they couldn't get without you, but cost you nothing. And I see somebody here who says, I'm in a tiny branch uh, with one staff person, but she's doing it. She says, we do some Play-Doh and sidewalk chalk that are popular. Excellent, excellent job. Because I know you don't have a lot of staff time and a lot of extra resources. So you're doing what you have to do to keep it vibrant in there. We've got something similar to the post-it reviews where a library uses bookmarks with a thumbs up that kids can put on the books that they like. That's smart. Okay, guys, um, I guess we're about to wrap up here, if, unless you have any burning questions. Seems like we've uh, come to the natural end. Okay.